Hi, folks. Growing up, I always felt that pinball games on the 8-bit computers and consoles lacked that spark that made them transcend their pixelated origins. And it wasn't until, at least I feel, that the arrival of games like Pinball Dreams or Epic Pinball really provided those thrills on a home computer. Well, it's what I originally thought until I got into playing David's Midnight Magic. Originally developed by David Snyder, hence the name, and published by Broderbund for the Apple II in 1981, the following year, there was a port to the Atari home computers, which was enhanced and tweaked a bit for an XEGS cartridge release in 1987. Then in 1983, the Humble C64 got its own conversion, this time handled by Martin Kahn, who seems to have really only done this in terms of his uh, body of work. So along with that C64 version, we're also going to look at the XEGS one and see how they fare. Like with most games of the period, it's all about racking up that high score. As you can see from the footage, the table layout is inspired by the classic Williams table Black Knight. And along with sharing most of the layout, there's also a lot of the features of that table that are available. The three ball multi-ball, magic saves, which, are, which allow you to deflect a ball heading for the outlines, along with banks of drop targets, bumpers, and rollovers, which allow you to increase your score, add bonus points for the post-drain countdown, and bang up the multiplier for more points. Starting with the C64 one, and which, as the final one out of the original releases, comes over pretty well, actually. But as you'd expect, there's always a few little things that happen in translation. The first of those is the control scheme. The original Apple version uses a scheme where you play with paddles. You use the buttons on the paddles to trigger the flippers and one of the paddle dials to actually control the plunger. On the C64, while there are, paddle, there are paddles available, they don't quite fit into the player's hands as well. And as a result, it's a little cumbersome to try and play that like that and also use the keyboard for various options. So what's being done is the controls have been completely reworked to use the keyboard. And this actually works really well. Sitting on the couch and trying to use the paddles on the keyboard is really inconvenient. I'd find myself having to hold those and reach for the keyboard on a lot of occasions. But just using the keyboard, I could sit down in a position, have all those keys accessible and be able to quickly use them to interact with the table, which gives that experience a little bit closer to that of a real pinball machine. That being said, I wish the keys were a little different. One of the things I found was that I couldn't solely rely on just blind key positioning, like positioning my fingers blind, because the keys are slightly off. You use the shift key for one of the flippers, the Commodore key for one of the other flippers, and then letters in between to act as the, uh, the magic save. The problem is, when you're frantically playing and trying to hit that magic save, you have to remember to have your, key, your fingers positioned a certain way in order to be able to trigger it, and I frequently fumbled that up when doing so but it feels a lot better than trying to wrangle a joystick as some other pinball games have done. As for the graphics, they're a solid adaptation of what originally came from the Apple II. Of course, this time rendered using the C64's multicolor graphics mode, and they come off pretty well, although the colors are a bit odd by comparison. One of the problems I actually had was that looking at the drop targets, sometimes it's a little hard to tell which of them are and I, which of them have and which of them haven't been hit. It seemed to be a little more of an occurrence with the ones at the edges of the bank. Now, one thing that's actually very interesting that I looked at when preparing this review was a bunch of uh, crackers took a look at it and actually did an enhanced version, recolouring the graphics to be more of a modern style, well, at least modern at the period they put it together. It looked clearer and a lot more functional, but I wasn't able to actually play it in time for, for this review. Then there's the audio, which is probably the worst part of the game. As you expect coming from the Apple II, you know, that system only has just a, a basic speaker for audio. It doesn't have a sound chip, which means sound effects are limited to basic bleeps and bloops. And sadly, that's what you hear on the C64. And sure, it's 1983, you can't expect great audio out of the SID, people haven't mastered it, but you could still, affect, still expect some decent sound as a result. Thankfully though, the playability is intact. 
But that being said, I do wonder if there's timing issues between an American NTSC system and a PAL system like I'm recording this on. As for research, I actually checked the Apple II version out in an emulator and I found it was a little easier to, with some of the ball physics, to actually trigger the multi-ball and some of the other effects on the table. I couldn't do those as easily on the 64 and I don't know if it was down to that or maybe I'm wrong and the physics are slightly tweaked a little too much. But that's the C64 port. How is it fair on the Atari side of the fence? Well, I think the first thing we have to get out of the way is simple. There is a lot of green here. Now this is basically down to the choice of graphics mode used. In order to bring this game over quickly, they obviously decide to use a graphics mode that relies on the NTSC artifact for colours, which of course is how the Apple II's video hardware um, does its thing, at least for in America. But while the Atari can do that again on an NTSC system, on a PAL system like mine, you get the raw high resolution graphics and it really loses a lot of the character here. Now, that being said, I don't know if there's been a fixed version of the game. Someone may have done one unofficially that does actually fix that up. Like the C64 vo version, the sound is again underwhelming. And again, it's for similar reasons. They just brought over the stock bleeps and bloops from the Apple and just got it coming out of the Pokey sound chip, but not actually took it, taken advantage of what Pokey can do. As like the SID chip, it's quite a, quite a powerful bit of sound hardware. Despite all of that, however, gameplay is most important. And again, the gameplay has been preserved here, and it feels just as great as it does on the C64 in my eyes. Though, things have been changed up a bit with the controls. Like the original Apple version, the original disc release for the Ataris also used a combination paddle and keyboard control scheme. It makes sense on those, as a lot of those early Atari games did rely on paddles, and they tend to be a lot more common back in that time because of the Atari 2600. For the XEGS, paddles weren't as big a thing, and in order to allow the game to be fully playable on the base XEGS console without needing the keyboard, the controls have been recoded to use the joystick. And what this means for me is you lose a bit of the precise flipper control. Being able to frantically hit a key independently of one another you know, at a very quick stage is one of those important things for precise, you know, for maximizing your pinball skill. But here using the joystick, I feel that it's, it's there's a little extra bit of latency in switching from banks of, of the flippers because you have to pull the joist in the opposite direction. It, it's a step backwards for me. And that's, there we go. David's Midnight Magic on the C64 and the Atari 8 bits. Both are well playable conversions. They make for a great game of pinball, but for me personally, the little things that matter just make the C64 one a better play for me. The fact that running a PAL system, the C64 version looks proper, looks correct, and is nice and, and is colourful, helps a lot, but more importantly, it's the keyboard controls. They really do make a better fit for this type of game, as a lot of later pinball games would, would adopt. And the result is, it's just more fun for me to sit down and have a play off. That being said, don't discount the Atari version. If you happen to have an Atari 8-bit, especially if you are lucky enough to be in the States or another region that uses NTSC hardware, you will get the graphics looking proper and correct, and it will look good and it will play just as well. And to be honest, my experiences with the joystick controls are ones that may not matter to you. You might find that the joystick works perfectly fine and that I play it wrong. Either way, you're not going to have a bad time with David's Midnight Magic is a great early pinball game that actually convinced me that early pinball games are good. Well, at least if you like pinball. If you don't like pinball, it's going to be a whole other story. And with that, thanks again for watching. I hope you enjoyed this review. If you did, please consider leaving a thumbs up or a comment. It does help you know, spread the love. Uh, if you're a subscriber, many thanks for doing that. Yeah, subscribers are always cool. And if you haven't, do consider it for more gameplay and reviews. Thanks again, and I'll catch you next time.